this session uh, we're calling Passive Solar Intelligent Design. Uh, and what could be better than making sure that we try to do things intelligently, right? And, and obviously passive solar is a very important piece of, uh, you know, of design in terms of how we uh, think about things. So we're going to hear uh, from two folks today, from, first from Michael Hindle, who is the chair of the Mid-Atlantic Passive Home Alliance, and then we will hear from Asit Parikh, who is a partner with Zenesis Design Build. And so, um, Michael, go for it. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm with Mid-Atlantic Passive House Alliance, and I want to make one clarification right off the bat. Um, while what we do is, is drawn from North American pioneers in passive solar design and super insulated envelopes, we are not your grandfather's or father's passive solar. What I'm talking about today is passive house, which is very specific energy standard and associated building methodologies. So I'm going to begin uh, very briefly with a little bit of background to explain why we need to do this. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you all know, I assume, has declared that we need to achieve 85 percent carbon emissions reductions by 2050 to avoid cl catastrophic climate change. The, meanwhile, the International Energy Agency is projecting rapid increase in demand for energy worldwide, driven in large part by third world economies coming online and using more fuel and demanding more energy. And uh, most of that increase is in oil and gas. If we had a 300 percent increase in renewable energy market penetration, we would be nowhere near our goal of the carbon emissions we have to achieve. So the conclusion there is that there is absolutely no way to generate our way out of this problem. I'm not speaking against renewable energy sources. I'm saying we have to do all of that, but if we do not address energy efficiency, we have accomplished next to nothing as far as climate change is concerned. Uh, we are dis disproportionately responsible in the United States. We use roughly twice, we emit roughly twice the amount of carbon per capita as other advanced civilized uh, industrialized countries. Uh, other countries that are beating us in the green energy market, such as Germany and Japan, have equally high standards of living but are emitting half the amount of carbon. So let's not allow any of our politicians to tell us that this will represent a loss in jobs or a loss in living standards or a loss in our way of life because it simply will not. Uh, finally, buildings represent 48 percent roughly of carbon emissions. So if we, do, we have to begin or we have to at least prioritize uh, the carbon emissions associated with building operational energy use, which is where Passive House comes in. So. Passive House, it turns out, the good news is that Passive House delivers these levels of energy use reductions and associated carbon emissions reductions. It delivers them now. Uh, basically, in Europe, there's a group of scientists, the 2000 Watt Society, which aggregated climate data and said, how much energy can we use as a, as a global society and still have a habitable climate? And the answer was 2000 watts of continuous usage per capita. Now, if you extract out the heating and cooling energy of that total amount of energy we can use for food production, uh, manufacturing, and everything else, transportation, everything we do in our lives, we're left with about the equivalent, an energetic equivalent of a hair dryer to heat our home on the coldest day of the year or use that same amount of energy to cool it on the hottest day of the summer. So Passive House achieves this now. So what is Passive House? It is the most ambitious and tested energy standard in the world. You haven't heard in the United States. That's because Europe is 15 to 20 years ahead of us. Uh, it is also an associated uh, assortment of building methodologies and strategies and a set of basic design principles, which I'll get to in a moment. It achieves 90 percent energy use reductions for heating and cooling. That's the standard. It's not optional. You can't get a certain number of points and get a certain level of certification. You do it or you don't. Uh, and it achieves, when you add back in your appliances, uh, lighting, computers, etc. it achieves 70 to 80 percent energy use reductions overall before renewable energy is applied, which means that renewable energy at that point is much more cost effective to apply and zero out your energy demand. So basically the design principles are that we focus on minimizing the demand in the first place. We do this by optimizing the thermal envelope with a super insulated envelope and high performance windows and doors. We have an airtight envelope 
which reduces the amount of energy that is lost through the infiltration and exfiltration of air, but also as an important health and safety consideration, reduces the amount of moisture that could be in, uh, introduced into the building envelope, which could lead to mold, mildew, and uh, rot or building failure. Uh, we have, in order to then live in these tight houses, which incidentally do have operable windows, this will not feel like any other, like it will not feel different from any other house, but the building envelope, when you want to close up and have it be energy efficient, is very tight. So we need a ventilation system. The ventilation system introduces a fresh flow, uh, a constant flow of fresh air, which has been filtered, and also heat exchanged. So all the energy loss that might be associated with losing warm air to the outside in the winter is transferred to the incoming air supply. They're about 96% efficient, so there's almost no energy loss associated with ventilation. Uh, we eliminate thermal bridges in construction. So if you have an R13 wall in this country, a code-built wall, there's a wood stud going through which has a lower R value, so that wall actually is maybe an R11 if you're lucky. So we eliminate thermal bridges and have a super insulated envelope. Finally, we optimize, and perhaps not finally, but the last on my list, but it's, they're all happening at the same time in the design process, is we want to optimize for solar gain through building orientation, the solar heat gain factor of your windows, and you want tune shading uh, devices to keep out sun in the summertime. So generally people say green buildings are prohibitively expensive, which is not true. Turns out that if you pursue this strategy and reduce your demand so much that you can virtually eliminate your heating and cooling system, which means that your passive houses have been built in the United States for an incremental cost increase in construction of two to 15%. The 15% house I saw had enormous north-facing windows, which is not a good passive solar design decision, so I think that 15% was driven by their desire for a view. So they are cost-effective now, and that, say, let's just say to be safe, 2 to 10% incremental cost increase in construction is offset by 80% uh, en operational energy decrease. So if we were to make every house in this country every building in this country, it can be commercial or institutional, 30% more efficient right now. We, every house or building between now and 2050 would have to be net positive 34%, which we all know is not going to happen. If every building in the country right now were to be 50% more efficient, every building built between now and 2050 would have to be passive house. So that gives you an idea of how, how important energy efficiency in buildings is. So there are all sorts of corollary benefits. My time is up, so perhaps in the question and answer period, if we have any, uh, we can get to those. But now as Sid is going to talk about a uh, particular case. Hi, thank you very much, Michael, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being in attendance here. And special thanks to the representatives. And you want this one? Sure. Oh. Hi. Oh. Yeah. Special thanks to representatives and members of the legislative staff that are here, also in attendance. Um, I was here last year at the 13th Annual Renewable Energy Caucus, and it's been quite a year, hasn't it? We've witnessed some serious storms and climactic forces that have, we've never seen before in this country, with the swollen Mississippi River right now pushing over its banks and threatening farm life and ways of life for many people down in the, su the southern central part of the United States. Uh, we've had a housing bubble completely burst, and smithereens fell to the ground when we had existing buildings that were torn down and new energy hog, the term McMansion's been used, have started sprouting up all over the country. And these were all overvalued and poorly built and terrible on energy. And there's a certain trend going forward that Michael first addressed with the Passive House program, which is to simply change the way we're using energy and change the way our building stock is using energy in this country. And, and you mentioned the number, 48%. That's roughly close to the amount of carbon output the building sector produces in the United States alone. So I come from the building sector, the design-build portion of the economy where that uses a tremendous amount of carbon, not just at the, at the after the buildings are built, but after they're occupied and after people are using them to heat and cool. So the perspective that I come from is I think we can, using creative engineering and architecture and principles of thermal reclamation, create an energy efficient box, build a better box than out there today, and do so in a manner that A, doesn't cost more than it, it should, and B, uh, it, it creates a situation where you no longer have to sacrifice to be eco-friendly. And I'm going to get into a specific example quite soon. 
Uh, my, my company's background, just to give you a little bit of uh, history on us. In 06, we won an award for Global Green USA. We rebuilt 16 square blocks of post-Katrina New Orleans according to a net zero energy affordable housing model. So all the buildings produce 100% of their own energy, and they were all able to be purchased by local community workers and people that were not extremely wealthy or didn't have an excess of 15% to invest right off the bat. Uh, from then, we've been taking our model of net zero energy design and spreading it throughout the country. In California, we work uh, especially with the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of Los Angeles, and we're redeveloping certain buildings that are funded by public money, but we're meeting the Title 24 energy standard. In New York, we're working with New York State Energy Research Development Authority to leverage ratepayer funds and to take advantage of various regional greenhouse gas initiative dollars that are incentivizing multifamily building owners to also reduce their energy consumption on site. And that's going to be the theme of what I talk about today is you can produce energy renewably or not so renewably all you'd like, but if you don't reduce how much each specific site demands, then we're not doing very much at all. And the house that I was presenting all in the other room, the other, it's a home that actually I grew up in. Uh, we're calling it the Zenesis House. It's a 60-year-old timber structure that we're retrofitting to a net zero energy passive house standard. And the reason we're doing this is it's multifold. For one, we want to be able to show that new construction aside, there's a tremendous building stock in the United States that was designed back during the time when fuel and the cost of fuel was an afterthought. You know, the houses built 50 years ago were designed very much the way cars 50 years ago were built. They were very wasteful, very, very big engines, lots of output, and nobody cared because fuel costs were an afterthought. Now, every time fuel prices go up, people start worrying about conservation, and here we are at the crossroads with another one of those times going on right now. Uh, we're also out to show that, as I mentioned before, you don't have to give anything up. Let me give you an example. In New Orleans, what we ended up doing to air condition these buildings was using groundwater, very nearby groundwater that was about 10, 15 feet below the soil in a very swampy area. And we ended up finding out that this water gets heated. And so why, would, why do we need to throw away that heat? So in the home that I'm building, our wine cellar in the basement, the refrigeration aspect is giving off so much heat that we're using that heat to heat the rooftop hot tub. We don't need to give up luxuries anymore. You know, we can do things. We could have a thermally insulating roof, or we can call it a roof garden, one way or the other. But there, there's, you're allowed to have hedonism. You're allowed to have excess in an eco-friendly home. It's no longer one or the other. And it's an approach that we're going forward with. Oftentimes, I'm met with a lot of resistance. You know, do you have to be a granola hippie liberal to do this? And the answer is no. You know, at the center of all of this are very, very conservative principles. The principle of fiscal responsibility, you know, not spending more than you need to. The principle of not letting the next generation shoulder the environmental debt we're leaving for them. Forget about the financial debt, but the, the, car, the, the drilling we're doing below rock, the way we're fracturing rock and ruining the groundwater just to get a few drips and drops of natural gas is not the best way forward. Only to burn it in a wasteful furnace? No, that's not the way to do this. You know, the best way to do this is to take the natural resource gifts specific to each and every site and use them. It pains me as a designer to see McMansions go up exactly the same house, one house across the street from the next. Well, the sun is hitting these houses differently, very differently. Why do they look the same? They shouldn't. You know, and it's a responsibility of people on the end user scale, people that own the homes that they are in today, the ones that say, I want to knock down this house and build a new one right here. It's, it's their responsibility to say, wait a second, can I preserve my existing structure? Instead of tearing this down and building a box that's also going to burn tons and tons of fuel, can I take that same money that my neighbor spent in tearing down that house and use it to make my structure that much more insulated? Can I do it? And the, chan the answers are, chances are yes, probably you can. You know, can I take my two air conditioning condenser units outside and get rid of them completely and use the ground below my slab to cool my house? And you probably can. And the gifts are all there. It's all free. It's there for the taking. The sun shines on every property every day. And only the lucky ones, in my opinion, are the ones that are able to extract value from that. And same goes for the wind that blows. You know, it's not about just being the only house on the block that has power when the storm is out. It's about being the house on the block that produces power when the storm is out and knocks out the power. And I think that can be done, and it's being done. And I'm working with, you know, various you know, utility-based payer funds and regional greenhouse gas funds, like I said, to help incentivize and additionally lower the capital cost of some of these investments. And what we end up doing is we build a house that performs differently. You build a super insulated wall is going to behave with moisture much more differently than a leaky wall will. And as a result of that, you can, as Michael said, 
cut out the furnace from a house, cut out the air conditioning system, and it turns out you end up costing the same at the end of the day, and you have a building that's going to last much, much longer, and, that's, and there's, no, there's nothing more sustainable than something that lives to see another day. You know, you can have an eco-friendly home that's going to only last you one generation, but what has that done for you? If you have a home that lasts you 300 years because it's built better and it used less energy the whole time, now we're talking about progress. And we're talking about progress at no additional excess cost. And I really think that's the best way forward. Uh, energy independence very much is tied to freedom and national security, and energy security is our key out of this. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there is a lot of good information there.